Good afternoon. The title of my talk today is Cone Beam CT Does Not Lie, But Liars May Use Cone Beam CT. My name is Jeffrey Miller. I graduated from Towson University, did my dental uh, school education at University of Maryland. I got my orthodontic certificate at SUNY Buffalo. I've been in private practice in the Baltimore metropolitan area for about 32 years. We had our first uh, comb beam CT machine installed in 2011. Now the, the, the reason for the title, uh, comb beam CT does not lie, but liars may use comb beam CT as a play off of, Mar of obviously a play off of Mark Twain's statistics don't lie, but liars use statistics. And it really, hopefully, I can show you examples of how looking at single slices of cone beam CT can be very deceptive in terms of the bony support for, for teeth. Now, I pulled this case, case off the internet. This is a case that was treated with expansion orthodontics. And uh, I would ask, if, is this a well-treated case? Now, obviously, the, the the teeth in the clinical photos look beautiful, and the um, smile looks great. So by what standards are we judging this case? And that's what uh, I hope to explain uh, during this talk. The first step is we have to decide as orthodontists, where do we place the teeth? Where do the teeth, teeth belong? We can't just arbitrarily place the teeth uh, anywhere we want. Uh, we hear our, some of our colleagues saying, well, I like, I prefer a wider, broader smile. Well, who says? That's where the teeth belong. There's a place that Mother Nature has for those teeth, and as orthodontists, I think we kind of kind of lose the, the science that backs up what we do by just arbitrarily uh, attributing certain treatment objectives uh, uh, priority over others. Going, going back to Dr. Andrews' Six Keys to Normal Occlusion, I think that his study is um, worth mentioning. He studied 120 casts of non-orthodontically treated patients. And basically what he do, did was he looked where Mother Nature placed the teeth without orthodontic, any one of these patients having orthodontic treatment. And he, and he took measurements and he came up with six uh, keys or, or six conclusions. And I think these, these uh, six keys are as relevant today as they were in 1972. They describe where Mother Nature intended the teeth to be. And as orthodontists, uh, I think it's, there's a certain amount of arrogance to just uh, arbitrarily feel that we can place the teeth anywhere we want. Mechanically, it's not an issue to do that. But are we really doing the best thing for our patients? And basically what he was saying was that the teeth are centered over the thickness of the alveolar bone. They're in the, in the trough. There are two relevant points, I think, that are related to orthodontics, cone beam CT, and uh, Dr. Andrew's six keys to normal occlusion. And that the teeth are usually centered within the bony trough in a normal occlusion and the artificially expanded arches are not ex consistent with Mother Nature. You're starting to hear some names pop up in the orthodontic community. Dr. Vaden uses the term dental dimension. Dr. Nel Gerald Nelson out in California uses the term housing. And um, we like to use the term boundaries. They really all describe the th same thing. They're describing the bony limitations to orthodontic tooth movement. This is a, a drawing of uh, a force diagram where the uh, a, a weight is attached to one of the anterior teeth and uh, you would have a constant force. And I don't think there's an orthodontist on the planet that would tell you that if you left that weight there long enough you wouldn't orthodontically extract a tooth. Where is the limit to the movement of the, of the tooth orthodontically? Um, we all agree that there is a, a limit, we just don't know where that limit is. 
if you remember from uh, histology, you have osteoclastic uh, activity on the compression side of the ligament, and you have osteoblastic activity on the tension side of the ligament if the tooth is moving through the bony trough in this direction. That's fine as long as the tooth stays in the bony trough. But when you start taking the tooth and you expand it either buccally or lingually, there's really no opportunity for op osteoblastic activity on the leading edge of that root. You only have osteoclastic activity or primarily osteoclastic activity. Here's what I believe happens when a lower anterior tooth is moved or expanded facially or buccally. And the lower anterior region is probably the most sensitive to this movement because you have the thinnest cortical plate and you have the, the least amount of bone to maneuver the tooth. If you looked at it from a coronal view, and these, the force on this tooth is to push it buccally, if you look at the coronal view or what it would look like on a panorex, you wouldn't see much change because the interceptal bone heights don't change. If you look from a sagittal view, as the tooth moves forward, you get dehiscence of the root through the cortical plate, and then you get adaptive resorption of the alveolar process on the lingual of the tooth. So once the tooth is in its final position, the tooth still appears to be centered within the alveolar process, especially when you're looking at a cephalometric x-ray. That could be responsible for why we use we have a, a, a theory in orthodontics that there is a that we call dental alveolar movement. Well it's really I don't believe it's really dental alveolar it's more dental and then you get resorption and of the alveolar process to make the tooth look centered but that's another discussion. From an axial view the tooth is pushed forward you have interceptal fibers that are still under tension so you get a, a cupping of the root of the tooth and then you get resorption of the lingual bone and that's why the tooth still appears to be centered. This is a case, uh, these, are, these are the same patients, this is actually the same image, the only difference is the a focal trough. On the left the focal trough is 77 millimeters, on the right the focal trough is 0.2 millimeters. And this patient is 25 years post-treatment. She came in because she broke her lower fixed retainer. I believe this is a, more of an acute problem because you haven't seen the resorption of the bone on the lingual process, uh, lingual uh, side of that tooth yet. But if you look at the cephalometric x-ray, it looks like there's no problem there. The teeth may be a little procumbent, but it looks like you have a flexing of the alveolar process when in fact really you just have the tooth moving through the, the bony housing and uh, creating, imp creating a boundary violation. Now, why is this mission critical and why, is this, why th should this be in my opinion a part of the orthodontic discussion today? Well it's mission critical, be critical because if we push the teeth through the limit of the cortical plate we create dehiscence or fenestration. Bone does not grow or remodel at the cortical plate. It's just that simple. You get interceptal bone changes. But to, to think that you're gonna, you can just push these teeth out and expand them to wherever you want is, not, is, is just not realistic. Now where is the limitation before we create clinical problems? It's still unknown. Here's a case, uh, this is a 29 year old uh, a, a male patient. He was um, already missing two lower incisors. Uh, he's he's uh, class two malocclusion. His t he has some dental crowding and he, I would say he has a thinner gingival biotype based on the little bit of tissue stripping we already see on the upper incisors. There's his occlusals. And our plan was to extract two upper bicuspids and do aggressive interproximal reduction on the lower arch. There's the pan and ceph. If you notice, the upper right central incisor has a root canal. He had a history of trauma. So instead of extracting the teeth from day one, we wanted to make sure there was no issue with that 
upper central incisor. So we level aligned the upper and then made his decision to extract the teeth. Now here he is three months later. Things are aligned. You can see this is the upper left lateral incisor here and that's the tooth I'm concentrating on for this talk. But you can see that the, the tooth is fairly well centered within the alveolar process, although his upper alveolar process is fairly thin. Here are the clinical photos. You can see that the teeth are aligned but procumbent. And at this point, we were going to send him over to uh, get the two upper bicuspids uh, extracted. Now he's being treated with incognito lingual appliances on the maxillary arch and traditional appliances on the lower arch. Well, at, at this point, he decided that um, he did not want to have those teeth extracted. He, ch he decided against them, against it. So we we took another, we took a progress uh, coming CT, and we th we thought it looked okay. And if he was willing to live with the recumbency and the high probability of relapse, we were okay with it as well. Now, unfortunately, we put a rectangular wire in. And a little over a year later, we noticed that he had uh, it's significantly increased tissue stripping. You can see, especially the upper left lateral incisor. And here's what it looks like. This is in March of 2015. Took a cone beam CT, and you can see that this root of this upper lateral incisor was pushed forward through the limit of the cortical plate. You can also see it over here, but maybe it's not as clear. Now here is uh, right after he got his braces in June, in September, and then a little over a year later, you can see the position of the upper lateral incisor root, how it's been pushed through the cortical plate. The torque on this upper lateral incisor does not match the, bone, the shape of the bone anatomy of the alveolar process there. We extracted, we talked we talk to him about, you know, the, the potential damage if he was to leave it that way, so we extracted the two upper bicuspids. This is uh, approximately five months later. We're closing the space. Case pretty much progressed well after after we extracted the teeth and here he is this is the right uh, the day we took the braces off or shortly after the day we took the braces off the teeth were retracted he's got a fairly decent overjet and overbite if I was to be critical I would say we need a little more uh, labial crown torque on these teeth but overall I think it's a decent result considering what he started with but if you notice the tissue stripping did not resolve. You, you know, you, uh, you may think, if, well, if I move the teeth over into better bone, the tissue stripping would go away. That, that hasn't, that did not happen. Now here's, here is uh, just when we, this is wait when we put the appliances on. Here is uh, after the rectangular wire and the root came f forward of the upper lateral incisor, and then here is at the completion of treatment. Here's the upper lateral incisor. Now, not, you know, I don't think there's an orthodontist in the, on the planet that would say that tooth is in, in great bone. You'd much rather see that tooth torqued back or at least sitting more centered w within the alveolar process. However, when you look at the axial view, you can see there's a fairly good cupping of bone around that tooth. There's no bone around the facial, but when you look from about here around to about here, it looks to be bone. And this is this is a slice taken halfway down the root of the tooth. Here's what he started with. This is when we first put the braces on. And here's what he ended up with. Now, is it possible that new bone will fill in over time? Uh, I have no way of knowing. It's po it is possible. But my point is, here is that same patient, the same tooth. This slice was taken about halfway down the root of the tooth and you can see that from this axial view, it's 1.8 millimeter axial slice, 
those teeth look like they're pretty well centered in the bone. However, if I take the slice and move it down, that lateral incisor looks completely different in terms of its bony support. Okay? So when you take a look at these axial views, and most of the time when you're looking at uh, these on, on, uh, cases on the internet, they're showing axial views of these teeth, and they're saying, look how well the teeth are centered within the bone. You have no way of knowing where that slice was taken. You can also thicken up the focal trough and make it look even better because now it looks like there's plenty of bone on the palatal side of the tooth where there really isn't. So you can manipulate these things and make them look you can make it look like there's more bone or less depending on 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 how you you uh present the image. Comey CT is not a static view. It's not like a Ceph where you just look at it. You, you, it's a dynamic evaluation of the of the image. You're slicing through from the a, you know from the apex down to the to the crown of the of the tooth, and you're looking at all the different slices in all three planes of space. And when you look at all those in your mind, you have to stitch them together to kind of ascertain the amount of bony support for individual tooth. Here's another case. This case came in. It's about uh, seven years post-treatment. Wasn't a great patient. He he uh, actually he got his braces off, never came back, and then he came back in because he was having problems with his lower incisors. His dentist, his general dentist, saw there was a problem and sent him back to us. If you take a look at the panorex, looks pretty good. All the teeth look, the roots look parallel, and you wouldn't. Uh, suspect any issues there at all. And then if you look at the cephalometric x-ray, it looks it actually looks fine. Now you might be wondering why uh, I take the, the images with the, the bite open versus closed. And I think with cone beam CT there's, there's benefits to leave them open when you take the scan. You can get the registered the occlusion from other methods other than the uh, comb beam CT. The with taking the image opens helps you be be able to separate the mandible from the maxilla, so you can look at different views without the overlapping incisors. If this is a deep bite case, if I left the if he took it closed, that same image of his mandible would have the upper incisors in there, possibly confusing the issue. But you look at the root of this. If you look at the root of this lower right la uh, lateral incisor, you can see it's perforated through on the lingual. And the lower left lateral incisor is perforated through on the facial. Now, th this kid reported a history of chewing on plastic water bottle caps. And those forces, in it, combined with a lower fixed retainer, created these 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 type of movements that were bad for him. I clipped away some of the of the clinical crown of the tooth so you can kind of see where the root position is over the bone. And you can see how this is dehissed through over on this on this upper lower left lateral incisor and that's dehissed on the lower right lateral incisor. This is the mandible with a uh, a sagittal slice you can see this is the lower, this is tooth number 23, the lower left lateral incisor. See where it is over the bone. And there is a, there's the uh, slice image of it. It's a uh, 0.18 millimeter slice. If you took up tooth 26, you can see the root kind of is on a weird angle. You can see it better here. Same thing, this is a, a 0.18 millimeter slice. And then if you look at his clinical photo, you can see the how this root is protruding back. Now, in his particular case, he still has some he still has bone, so we can probably reposition this tooth. And that's what we suggest that we do, that we put bra brackets back on the bottom and torque those teeth into a bit much better p position. But when you look at this 
photo. And, and I asked you again, is this a well-treated case or a poorly treated case based on what standard? If you look at the, protrud uh, the protrusion of this root, you can see down here all these roots are protruded. Maybe not to this extent, but certainly, certainly similar. I would say the cases are similar. I think it's a, a topic of conversation that orthodontists should have. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to email me. My email is ortho606 at gmail.com. Thank you for listening.